God is good. All the time. All the time. Please be seated. <clears throat> Tom? Our first scripture reading comes to us today from Romans chapter 3, verse 19 through 28. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace, as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And then we'll turn to Matthew chapter 22 and start with verse 1. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized the servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And then the king said to the attendants, Bind him, hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. In order for you to get the greatest benefit for what we're about to do, you have to try and think back quite a few hundred years, 15, 17, give or take. And uh, you have to hate the man that's coming up here because he is proposing something new. And we, the official people of the church, the pastors and the other leaders, have found fault with him, <clears throat> so much so that we want him dead. The politics around him are raging because there is a battle between whether the Pope is going to control the country or the king is going to control the country. And so not only is he a fixture in the religious realm, he is also very significant with the political overtones of what he says and does. Not so much different than the culture you're living in. 
But right now, you get to sit in the audience, and we get to put him on the spot here. And so we ask that you would be encouraged, listen to what he has to say, as these were recorded and uh, shared by the words that were written down. Here we go. Luther, you're on. Most serene emperor, illustrious princesses and gracious lords, I this day appear before you in all humility according to the command, and I implore your majesty and your august highnesses by the mercies of God to listen with favor to the defense which, of a cause that I am well assured is just and right. I ask your pardon if by reason of my ignorance I am wanting in the manners that befit a court for I have not been brought up in the court, but in the cloisters. I have not been uh, brought up in the king's palaces, and I claim no other merit than that of having spoken and written with the simplicity of mind and with regards n nothing but the glory of God and the pure instruction of the people of Christ. Two questions yesterday were put to me by the Imperial Majesty. First, whether I was the author to all the books that were read, and second, whether I wish to revoke or defend the doctrine I have taught. I have answered the first directly, and I adhere to that answer that uh, I have written the books. Those books are mine, and they were published by me, except for as they may have been altered or interpolated by the craft of my opponents. As for the second... I now reply to it, and I must first entreat your majesty and your highnesses to deign and consider that I have com composed writings on very different subjects. In some, I discuss faith and good works in a spirit all at once so pure and clear and Christian that even my adversaries themselves, far from finding anything to censure, confess that these writings are profitable and deserve to be perused by devout persons. The Pope's bull, as violent as it is, acknowledges this. What then should I be doing if I were now to retract these writings? Wretched man, I alone, of all men living, should not be abandoning truths approved by and the unanimous vote of friends and enemies, and should be opposing doctrines that the whole world glorifies in confessing. I've composed, secondly, certain works against the papacy, wherein I have attacked such false doctrines and irregular lives and scandalous examples that afflict the Christian world and ruin the bodies of souls and souls of men. And is not this confirmed by the grief of all who fear God? Is it not unmistakable that the laws of the human doctrines and of the popes entangle, vex, and distress the conscience of the faithful while crying and endless extortions of Rome engulf the property and wealth of Christians and more particularly, particularly of this illustrious nation. It is a perpetual statute that laws and doctrines of the pope be held erroneous and reprobate when they are contrary to the gospel and the opinions of the church fathers. If I were to revoke what I have written on that subject, what should I do but strengthen the tyranny and pen a wider door to so many and flagrant heresies, bearing down all resistance on and fresh fury, fury, we should watch these proud men swell, foam, and rage evermore. And not merely would the yoke which now weighs down Christians be made more grinding by my retraction, it would thereby become lawful, for by my retraction it would receive confirmation from your most serene majesty and all the states of the empire. Great God, I should be like an infamous cloak used to hide and cover over every kind of malice and tyranny. In the third place, 
I've written some books against private individuals who have undertaken to defend the tyranny of Rome by destroying the faith. I freely confess that I may have attacked such persons with more violence than consistent with my profession. I do not think of myself as a saint, but neither can I retract these books. By doing so, I would sanction the impieties of my opponents, and they would thence take occasion to crush God's people with still more cruelty. Yet, as I, a mere man and not God, I will defend myself for the example of Jesus Christ. Therefore, most serene emperor, emperor and you illustrious princes, and all, whether high or low, who hear me, I implore you by the mercies of God to prove to me by the writings of the prophets and by the apostles that I am in error. As soon as I shall be convinced, I will instantly retract my errors and I will confess, I, will, I, will, my, I myself will be the first to seize my writings and commit them to the fires. Luther, is it possible for you to, without all the flurry and oratory that you're demonstrating, to either stand by your statements or retract them. Get on with it. Since your most serene majesty and highnesses require of me a simple, clear, and direct answer, I will give one, and it is this. I cannot submit my faith to the Pope or to the council because it is clear that they have fallen into error and inconsistency with themselves. If then I am not convinced by proof of the Holy Scripture and cogent reason, if I am not satisfied by the very text I have cited, and if my judgment is not in this way brought into subjection to God's word, I neither can nor will retract anything, for it cannot be safe or honest for a Christian to deny or speak against his conscience. There I stand. I can do no, no of else. God help me. <clears throat> and as he left, he was kidnapped by some of his friends and hidden away so that his enemies would not kill him. That is the car of the basic history and the courage that it took for Luther to say and do what he did in the face of those enemies and people that he trusted and other things. Children, I'd invite you to come down if you would. Did you see the example of Martin Luther that Mr. Ebel did for you today? Did you know they wanted to kill him? Do you know they wanted to kill him because he was having them read the Bible and not allowing them to change it? It takes a great deal of courage to follow the Bible and not let people change it. Even sometimes the courage that the people that are listening to you may want to hurt you. In my sermon today, we're going to talk about how easy it is for the church to get it all mixed up because sometimes nobody likes being told that people want to kill him, do they? Would you like to know because you come to this church, we're going to hurt you and your family? Would you keep coming to a church If people started threatening you or your family, Luther said, I will. And he stood his ground. And he said, you do what you're going to have to do, but I'm going to stand with Jesus. There are people in the world today, including little ones like you, in countries where they want to kill Christians and burn down and destroy every building like this. They want to scare you so bad 
that you'll stop following Christ. And in those countries, those children, in some case, cases, are taken away from their parents. Some of them are hurt so bad that they die. And the country doesn't care. It takes courageous men, like Martin Luther was, to keep our country and our people on the right track and going in the right direction. My prayer is you never, ever have to deal with someone wanting to hurt you because you follow Jesus. But I know that sometimes that could happen. And so I'm going to encourage you today to understand it took men and women like Martin Luther and others who did not quit, who did not turn their backs or run away, but they stood their ground. Today I'm going to be asking the parents to stand their ground. We're going to be learning about two key words, law and gospel. And if we get them mixed up in the church, we lose the message of Jesus Christ. Luther helped the church of almost 500 years ago get its message right again. You may have to help the church keep its message right. So you have to understand, you and I get blessed because of what he actually said way back then. And the people who come after you will be blessed by what you say and what you do, including me. So that's my sermon for later, okay? You listen for that, and we're going to be talking about those things, and I'm going to be encouraging you to stand your ground with people like Martin Luther or pray for those kids over in many of the countries where those kids are hurt and taken from their parents because their parents love Jesus and are trying to help those kids learn about Jesus. Be very thankful for what we have here and never take it for granted. Can you remember that? Good. I got something for you. Ladies first. <clears throat> you boys are doing fantastic. Yeah. Go quick, though, ladies. By the way, there are voters' guides at the uh, entrance there. If you want one, please be encouraged to take them. You're welcome. You're welcome. Love one another as I have loved you. Bless those who curse you. Bless and don't curse. Love your neighbor like you love yourself. Forgive one another even as God in Christ has forgiven you. If I preach law or gospel, Have I preached law or gospel? That's law. All of it is law. It's directives. It's expectations. It is telling you how to live, act, and behave. Okay? That does not make it evil. But it is not gospel. What it does for people and what it may show is a gospel attitude towards someone but that's a different question. Ultimately, it's law because it demands something of you. Have you forgiven everybody that sinned against you? Shame on you. Do you love your neighbors like you love yourself? What the heck is wrong with this church? You want me to go through the list? Do you understand if I read it a little different, you begin to understand how it is law. You begin to understand the power of the directive. You begin to recognize that you uh, are under this, this, this warning of if you want to mess this up, you mess with the gospel. Don't do it. It isn't that God's telling you don't love your neighbor. It isn't that I'm telling you that you're not supposed to love your neighbor or forgive those who 
uh, have sinned against you or any of the other good things I could have written out and come up with. But it's important you understand, just because it sounds soft and feels good doesn't make it gospel. Just because it comes out of Jesus' mouth doesn't make it gospel. Now, I understand when I begin to manifest love for people that have hated me, I will be showing the presence of God in my life. If I'm doing it simply because the law has commanded me and I'm warned and the next time pastor asks the question, have you forgiven those who have sinned against you? 70 times, seven times? Or have you not? We will judge you heaven or hell based on that one law. Love one another as you love yourself. Heaven or hell based on that law alone in your life. Now you feel why it's law. Now you understand what Paul is going to be going through here and what Luther began to experience. Luther struggled because he understood law was law. He understood the expectations of God. He understood every time he turned around, like Paul who turned around in chapter 7 of Romans and said, you know, I didn't even know what coveting was. I didn't even understand what coveting was, lusting and wanting what other people have and more money and more stuff and a bigger house and a nicer this and a better that and whatever else. I didn't even know that was sin until the law exposed it in my heart. And I began to realize that I was a sinner, even down to coveting, and the law exposed me. Will I judge you on one single law? Do you covet? Do you want what other people have? Do you want more than you've got? Do you want a bigger home and a different place and a, a nicer car? And any, Should we judge you heaven or hell based on that one? And you begin to go, no, thank you. It isn't that God's got this messed up. It's the church gets it messed up. And you're the church. And we get it messed up because sometimes if you say things a certain way, it feels kind and generous and sensitive. It feels like we're manifesting the, such nice qualities. Love my neighbor as myself. I got some neighbors that suck. There may be someone sitting in your row you don't even like. We're not even talking people out there. We're talking to people that you are related to. People that you think God has called you to judge harshly because they do or they don't celebrate Halloween the way you do. People you think are really far away from God because of one thing or another and you begin to understand how this begins to work. And so Luther said, this is the heart of the Reformation. This is the heart of Scripture. This is the message that they wanted you to experience. Do you understand when Abraham heard this from God way back when in Genesis 15, it goes like this. Abraham believed the Lord, the promise that people, okay, uh, that his, his name would be great, he would have a descendant, and he would have multitudes like the stars. And he goes, Abraham believed the Lord, and he, God, credited it to him as righteousness. Then he went on later on to explain this concept that all nations will be blessed through you, Abraham. Guess what? That's before the commandments, that's before remember the Sabbath day. That's before honor your father and mother. All the nations will be saved by faith alone. There is no Sabbath day you have to remember. There is no law you come under. And God is not speaking against his law. He doesn't have this mixed up. He's explaining to you as Abraham was saved apart from works, as he was given the gracious promise of descendants more than the sands on the seashore, more than the stars in the heavens. As Abraham received that and believed him, it says in Romans, 
It was credited to him as righteousness, heaven bound, blameless before the people and before God. And so you begin to understand this is no small issue. This part of Romans is unbelievably significant. And you can't afford to mess it up because you're going to put yourself under law and there is absolutely no benefit to you to try and fulfill law. You should be fulfilling law because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. You should be uncovering law in the manifestation of the way you interact with people that have offended you. You know, I noticed the other day, I actually had forgiven him before I even thought about it. I noticed the other day, I didn't even react to that because I know she was having a bad day and he was really hurt and whatever the list goes on. It isn't that you're not going to manifest the qualities and the character of the law and fulfill the law. It's that you have to do it in accordance with the will of God because if you dare foolishly to bring yourself under law and say, oh, thank God I'm not like the people in this section. I'm so much better than them because I do what God asks me to do and I do it at a 10 level or a 9 level. They're only way down at a 2 or 3 level. And you begin to understand how arrogance and foolishness creeps in, and you begin to set up judgments and criterias where you actually think you're more deserving of salvation than some other sinner. Who cares what he did? He's a homosexual. He's a liar. He's an adulterer. She's a this. He's a that. Lies to his husband, wife. Terrible, terrible people. Uh, does that include you? Well, no. I, I'm really pretty good. I haven't murdered anybody, and I haven't committed any adultery, but I did lust after a woman the other day. What? You somehow think you're better than them? What, you don't need the gospel? You don't need God's word in your life? You don't need the power of forgiveness undeserved into your circumstances? You're missing out what's being said to you and the significance of what is going on right here, and you're going to miss out on the Reformation. You're going to slide yourself into a church that does these comparisons of good works. You know, if you really want some more good works, why don't you give me $10 and I'll make sure we pray a special prayer for you. We'll sell you a $100 indulgence. We'll get your uncle, your aunt, your husband, your wife out of that situation. Ah, oh, you're a $100 donor. You're only a $2 donor. Well, obviously I'm going to share over here, not with the $2 donor. And you begin to understand churches go like that. They slide into that. They hardly even realize they become those kinds of people. But we do it naturally. Everything's a comparison if you're not careful. You know, you estimate yourself. You go, man, that's way it. Boy, I had a good week or not so good. Oh, I really, oh my goodness, bad, sinful. Oh, no, it wasn't. And you remember, and you play that game in your head. And God goes, why are you even doing that? Why would you walk down that path? All it does is condemn you. All it does is destroy you. Even the tender words can destroy you because somebody just changes a little bit of the emphasis. And how many neighbors have you not loved like you love yourself? How many times have you talked with attitude in your voice that you thought you didn't have? How many times have you lied to yourself about your actions and behaviors when anybody else who knows you knows when you're ticked, knows when you're jabbing and stabbing and sarcastic and mean and everything else that we're all capable of. And so you go, what is going on in this text? And so I want you to turn there, if you would, into this section in Romans chapter 3, if you don't have your Bibles open. Please make sure they're open at this time. Starting at verse 19. We know whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. Guess what? I'm not under the law. Pfft, not because I'm not a jerk. Not because I'm not a miserable sinner. Not because of anything I've got. But I'm not under the law. Do you know why? Hopefully you'll figure that out. Watch the next point. So that every mouth may be silenced. Shut up. Who made you judge of your friend? 
Who allowed you to walk into somebody else's life and condemn them because of their lusts or because of their covetings or because of their meanness? Do what? Somehow God says, I've appointed you judge. You go in there and shout them down. And I'm not ignoring the passages where God says, speak to one another, rescue one another from the fire. I'm not speaking against that. I'm talking about attitude. I'm talking about I can walk up to you and say, brother, I think you're struggling with some immorality right now. Can I pray with you? Can I help you? That's one way of approaching a brother. I'm not going to have anything to do with you, you adulterous scumbag, you. And there may even be a time for that. But you're not given the privilege of doing it. It's given to the church. It's a responsibility because it's too easy for me in all the selfishness and pettiness that I'm capable of to bring your name down and to lift my name up and somehow look at you with a slanted view and a distorted view and say, it's too bad, you're just not as good as us Pharisees. Oh, that's a parable Jesus taught us. How easy it is to become like that in the name of Jesus, in the name of the church, in the name of loving you. And it's as insane as people saying, if you really loved women, you'd help them kill their babies. And you begin to understand, Paul, speaking these words, opened up Luther's mind to understand. Watch the next part. No one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. You can't go to enough Sabbaths. You can't have enough fasting. You can't do anything. You can't pray for enough hours in a day. You can't do anything. Watch what it says. No one will be declared righteous in the sight by observing any law. Should I observe law? Sure I should. But if I think somehow it makes me more righteous than you, thank God I'm not like the Pharisee or the publican, excuse me, over there. And you begin to go, wow, is God really hammering it like this? Of course he is. I can't let you walk that path. I can't let you go down where somehow you're going to slide into your holiness in comparison to Bruce's or somebody else's holiness. And I go, why would you walk that silly path? All you're doing is bringing yourself under law. It brings nothing but condemnation, judgment, and hell. Watch the finish of that. It goes, therefore, no one declared righteous. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Didn't you hear me change the word a little bit? Do you love your neighbor like you love yourself? You miserable scum? You useless so-called Christians? Did you feel the law come into your heart? Did you feel the condemnation and the judgment? Did you watch yourself become conscious of sin? You understand? And it's not only the sin of commission, where I did it on purpose, it's the sin of omission. No, I just don't have anything to do with them now. Oh. Yeah, I just don't even... And you go, is it possible to commit sins both ways? Yeah, it is. And so you begin to go... God's reading this, and Luther's getting it. He's feeling this. You've got to understand, this man was so ashamed and so guilty for his sin. He knew, he knew his unworthiness. What he didn't know is the mercy and the gospel of God. Luther, it says, would take a whip and whip himself on his back until he bled because he felt he didn't deserve what God has let him do, why God would let him live, a man like himself with the wretched inconsistencies. The law was doing its work. It was breaking him into pieces. It was exposing every little bit of his inconsistencies and his arrogance and his judgmentalism, everything in his life, he was super alerted to it. So the first part here was totally true. Now, 21 starts to come into his life. But now, a righteousness from God apart from fulfilling any law. The kid never honored his father and his mother. Can he be saved? Yes. The kid slept around with 14 different people. Can he still be saved? Yes. Apart from law, 
The kid never treated anybody or loved anybody like he loved himself. Can God still rescue him and forgive his sin? Yes. That's radically new. That's beyond our normal way of responding and thinking. He goes on, a righteousness, justification. You can put the word in there, sinlessness. I've been made sinless even though I'm a miserable scum. And if you want to recite your sins from, let's say, 12 on, you got to talk about high school? How about college? How about, oh, you never have fights with your wife? Disagreements with your husband? You're not a whiner and a powder? Can I ask your kids what they think of you as a father or a mother? You understand? This is why this is so important when it transitions into this statement, okay? But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. Abraham, by faith, was declared righteous. And this message is for all generations, for the entire world. And we begin to understand the significance of that point. And we recognize exactly uh, what's going on there. All right? From Romans it says, Abraham believed God. It was credited him as righteousness. And yet uh, it goes... Uh, In the same book of Romans, it said, Abraham was still waiting for a child, had not even had the first part of that promise answered, and still he operated in faith. Going on in the verse in front of you, it said, this righteousness from God comes by a totally different mechanism. I don't care how many commandments you followed this week. It's irrelevant in one sense. It should manifest real faith. And if there's no evidence there, we can ask the question, is there faith? But you begin to understand. His point is this, a righteousness apart from work, apart from doing, a righteousness that God did not make cheaply but cost his son's life. If you understand, you put on that scale where they're supposed to be balanced and you put down Bruce's sins and the weight scale keeps going down, and the lever up on the top says, damnation, damnation, damnation. And the answer comes back, what did it take to rescue Bruce from the miserable thing that he was? The literal blood of Jesus, balancing it out until all that was shed took and raised me to a point where a righteousness not from me brought me and my fortune and my future into the gift of heaven. It's called grace. And you have to live in grace, and you have to exercise grace. You have to exercise it with those closest to you and your family. Any of you been a consistent wife? A consistent husband? And if you not have something that you're ashamed of that we should put up on the screen and evaluate here? Any subtle double thoughts of, no, there's no problem here. I just hate your gut. We've all been there. We all do it. We've done it. And so here, as he goes on, he says, listen, there is no difference, but he points out, for all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. If you're not part of the all, what part are you of? Ready? I'll finish it with a little bit of Bruce at the end. And you're damned. Then go to hell. If you actually think that you're not included with all the worst of sinners. Because that's what this text is trying to get you to grapple with. This is Luther. He's hearing this. It's it's breaking his heart. But there's something that's starting to open up in his ears. He's starting to hear this. But now, but now, Luther, there's a righteousness from a part from what you've been, what you've said, what you've done, there's a righteousness that you need to come to grips with and that you need to experience. And he continues on that way. And he says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by grace through the redemption, the shed blood, the paid ransom, the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement 
The lamb was shed and killed, the blood put and sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. God passed over the sins of the people because of the lamb that was shed, but it had to be repeated every year until the blood of Jesus Christ took my scale and lifted me up and gave me a gift of righteousness that would never come to me, that none of my deeds could ever equal out. And you begin to recognize what's going on here. And it says, God presented him, Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this by demonstrating his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Did Moses sin? Yeah. Where should he be? Hell. Was the cross already done? No. Is Moses in hell? No. He's with the Lord. Why? Because God forbore, he forbear the sins of those individuals. I will carry those. One day the price will be paid in full. You and I get to live in the paid in full side of the equation. The only thing we do is we try and add our own dimension to it. Paid in full, and Bruce has had a really good week this week. So his mansion in heaven is going to be a little bit bigger. It makes him a lot better than those other pastors or those other people or those other men, or whatever goes through my stupid head. And you begin to understand what's going on. He said, he did it to demonstrate his justice in the present time so as to be both just and the one who justifies. God looks at you and says, you would never have been able to do it on your own. Even my nicest words, love one another, you couldn't even touch. You can't fulfill you won't do it right. But my blood will cleanse you from all sin. And the scale will rise until you're set free by the blood of Jesus Christ shed for you. And so it finishes off now in the last couple of verses we're going through. Where then is your thing you're going to brag about? Yeah, God sent me to judge all of my friends that I used to hang out with. You know, because I am a pastor and they're not. You know, Wow. Too bad. He's at, you know, you go, goes on. It, it, where is your boasting? It's excluded. On what principle? How come you don't get to boast? On the principle that of observing the law? No. You can do those comparisons. They're stupid. Some of you are nicer than your wives. Some of your wives are nicer than your husbands. <laughs> Has nothing to do with salvation. Has nothing to do with grace has everything to do with mercy of God, has everything to do with the need for the gospel to be preached to that wife or that husband until they become who God's calling them to become. And then you move forward from there, and it says this, all right? On observing the law, no, but on that of faith. For we maintain, we've concluded, we see the evidence that a man is justified by faith apart from observing any law. That's the gospel. Don't touch it with anything else. Don't look at your friends and say, God won't forgive you unless you do such and such a thing. You got to stand on your head and repent and do seven, th and don't do that. Let God be the judge. Not that you shouldn't encourage repentance. Not that that's not important in the relationship with God. But you are not the dispenser of God's grace. God's Holy Spirit is the dispenser of God's grace. And he will show grace to people like Paul, who killed Christians, considered himself more righteous than all of them, and still God saved him. A man like David, who felt it was okay to commit adultery... Lust after another man's house, a wife, and then determined that it was okay to have him killed because he had the power to do it. And God's gospel, God's grace was extended to that man, and it was said, This is a man after my own heart. Do you understand? The gospel is preached from beginning to end. It's demonstrated in the way God loves his people. It's demonstrated, and he takes nothing away from the law. 
He said, I will give you all the laws you need. Just in case, you know, there were many, many laws that he had to write down in you know, Le Le Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy because the people doing this with an animal is sin, in case you didn't know. Lusting after people in your heart is sin, in case you didn't know. Putting what you, you think you deserve is a sin, in case you didn't know. And then he comes back, but just so you do know, the gospel is the mercy of God extended to you, Bruce Harmon, because you believe the blood of Jesus Christ can take away all of the sins that you've committed and take an unholy man and make him worthy of heaven, not because of anything except the garbage in his life that he has to offer, but because of the precious blood of Jesus. Don't mess it up. Don't mess it up in your life. Don't mess it up in the way you treat people. And don't mess it up in the lives of your family and others around you. Pray with me. Lord, the gospel is so pure, so powerful, so simple. When Luther finally heard it and understood what it meant to be saved by faith alone, when he understood the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins, he let all those things related to his works, acts, and behaviors fall to the wayside, and he put them in a totally different category. He lived in a totally different relationship with you, Lord. And in that moment, set in motion for the church, for the world, for all the Christians, even those today who are able to live under the gospel and wise enough not to put themselves under law, have been set free. Lord, I know you want us to manifest your character, life, and actions to the world. And so I pray like we sang in the song, help us to draw near to you. Help us to be so close to you that your will, your heart, manifests in our life and actions. Come and bless us to that end, Lord. We pray this all in your name. God's people say, amen.